be serving as the moderator for today's conference. Liz Chudova, our steering committee vice chair, will be assisting with the question and answer sessions. Just getting our presentation started there. Ah, perfect. For some background on the Virginia Water Monitoring Council. The Virginia Water Monitoring Council encourages collaboration among water monitoring programs in Virginia. The council promotes communication through our weekly emails and water-related events, publications, and job opportunities from across Virginia and beyond. We currently have more than 700 participants who represent more than 275 organizations uh, uh, across the state. Our membership represents diverse interests from local governments, state and federal environmental agencies, academia, consultants, citizen scientists, and in industry. Anyone with an interest in the water marching is invited to join, and membership is free, and you really cannot beat free these days. If you're not a member, you're welcome to join at any time. Simply send your name, water monitoring affiliation if you have one, and contact information to vwmc at vt.edu. We hope you'll enjoy uh, join the Virginia Water Monitoring Council and if you're uh, not if you're already not a member. For today's conference, I'm pleased to now to recognize our 2021 scholarship recipients. Each year we honor the memory of Ken Brooks, who provided conference scholarships in his name. Ken was a longtime member of the Council Steering Committee, a volunteer water monitor, and a strong proponent of getting young people involved in water monitoring. This year, we awarded Ken Brooks scholarships that covered the conference registration fee to two undergraduates. McKenna Dunbar, who is double majoring in environmental studies and business administration at the University of Richmond, and Max Morin, who is a double majoring in environmental sciences and environmental thought and practice at the University of Virginia. Welcome McKenna and Max. We are also grateful this year for the Virginia Water Research Resources Research Center for providing scholarships to cover today's registration fee for five students. These recipients include Abigail Belvin, who is a PhD candidate in entomology at Virginia Tech. Liz Bikimia, who is working for on her master's in environmental studies at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Joshua Moser, who is a doctoral student in fisheries and wildlife scientists at Virginia Tech. Zachary Perkins, who is a master's student in environmental sciences at the University of Virginia. And Julia Portman, a master's student in biology at James Madison University. Congratulations to all of our scholarship participants, our recipients. We are grateful to have you with us today. I want to begin today to thank everyone for attending. Your participation in this year's annual conference helps to make this a success. At last count, we had more than 120 people registered for the conference. And looking at our attendance here, we are quickly filling that up. And 54 are online at the moment. I also want to thank our partners who made this a conference a possibility. Uh, we appreciate the presenters for giving their time today to uh, present at the conference and share their experiences and their interests with all of us. We also appreciated Henrico County in hosting this WebEx session. A very special thank you goes out to Enrico County's Kenny Mitchell, Morgan, Morgan Edwards, and Matthew Batroff, who is providing audiovisual support. Also, we want to acknowledge Matthew's advice service as a member of the Council Steering Committee as our Henrico uh, partner. We are grateful to the Alliance Chesapeake Bay for handling the conference registration. A special thank you goes to the Alliance's Stofi Stern and Liz Chudova. Like Matthew, Liz serves on the Council Steering Committee as the Vice Chair, and uh, Liz is also a presenter today as well. We appreciate the support from the Water Resources Research Center at Virginia Tech, 
As already mentioned, the Water, Research, Water Center provided funding for five scholarships for college students uh, to attend the event today. It also promoted the conference and provides administrative assistance to the Virginia Water Monitoring Council throughout the year. The Water Center's director, Stephen Schoenholtz, serves as the council steering uh, serves on the council steering committee. We appreciate the organization that are supporting today's conferences, the conference including the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality with funding from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the Virginia Lakes and Watersheds Association, and the Lake Anna Civic Association. And last but not least, I want to thank all the members of the Water Monitoring Council Steering Committee. The committee provides leadership to the council and helps plan the annual conference and other educational programs. We appreciate everyone's support and are glad to have you with us today. Before we begin the presentations, I do have a few housekeeping announcements. Each registrant has, sent, has been sent a copy of the conference agenda and we'll try to follow the, the times on the agenda as best as possible, but some flexibility may be required. We have planned a 15 more, minute morning break, an hour and a half for lunch, and a 15 minute afternoon break. If you have a question or comment for the speaker during the presentation, simply use the chat feature, which is located on the lower right hand corner of your screen. You may type in your question and comment in the provided text box and hit enter to submit it. During the question and answer period, Liz Chidova will read as many questions as possible and allow the presenter to respond. There will be a couple of short videos shown during the presentation. The videos can be viewed by clicking on the layout and then full screen in the upper right hand corner of your WebEx screen to provide the best resolution possible. If you experience any technical issues such as not being able to see the screen or cannot hear the speaker, simply type a description of the issue in the chat feature. Kenny Mitchell will do his best to help you fix the issue. Also know that today's conference is being recorded. All registrants will be sent a link of the recording after the conference. If you've requested a certificate of attendance, it will be sent to you by email the fo uh, following the conference. Also after the conference, you will receive a link to an online evaluation survey. It, we would ask uh, you the topics of the most interest for you for future events and ask if you know of good speakers for our 2022 conference, which hopefully we will have in person. We ask that you complete the survey and it should only take a few minutes. Your responses to evaluation has greatly helped us in the past to plan our uh, conferences to provide timely and effective presentations. That's all I have for housekeeping um, and for our opening remarks. And so we will begin our presentation here in just a moment. I actually went through my announcements a little bit quicker than, than we had planned. Well, we can get an early start to the conference. Um, so for today's uh, keynote speech, um, I'm pleased to announce um, Brian Richter. Brian is the president of Sustainable Waters. Uh, this global organization focuses on the challenges of water scarcity. Brian promotes sustainable water use and management with governments, corporations, universities, and local communities. He serves as the water advisor to corporations, investment banks, and the United Nations. Brian also teaches water sustainability at the University of Virginia. He previously served as the director of global water program for the Nature Conservancy and has consulted on more than 170 water programs nation, projects nationwide. Brian has received uh, developed scientific tools and methods to support water protection and restoration efforts. And he has co-authored a book with Sandra Postal entitled Rivers of Life, Managing Water for People and Nature. And his late, latest book is Chasing Water, a guide for moving from scarcity to sustainability. It has been published in five languages. Brian, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, and uh, and good morning to all of you out there. I uh, certainly wish, of course, that we could have mixed it up and uh, and been able to spend some time together in person, but 
um, we're making the best out of this virtual situation. Um, ironically, it enabled me to extend my vacation out in the Western United States uh, by a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm actually joining you from Moab, Utah, and it's a little bit earlier out here than it is uh, for you. Um, the topic that I'd like to talk about today um, has to do with water use and the changing water use in the United States. And I think it's a really, really interesting story, actually. Um, and I hope that you'll all find, uh, find something of interest in this presentation. So as I go through the presentation, if we could just advance, I'm just going to say click. Um, and so let's, let's go with the first click here. So I want to start by acknowledging my colleagues. So this is a project that is what I'm going to report on are some, some finalized results and some preliminary results um, from what has now become a three plus year project. And uh, these are some of my some of my key collaborators on this project uh, that have been working with us very closely. And I also want to acknowledge um, I pressed uh, a number of my UVA students um, into helping with this research project uh, over the last couple of semesters. So certainly want to give them some recognition too. Click, please. Okay, so here's the big picture that got us started. Um, we we became very fascinated with these changing trends in overall water use within the United States. And so on this slide, as you can see, the um, we've had very strong and steady population growth um, since the middle of the last century. And along with that population growth, the total water use in the United States um, increased, in, increased proportionally until about 1980. And then we started to see a very, very interesting shift um, or what we'll call in this presentation, a decoupling of the rates of population growth with the increases in water use. And so if you can click on the next bullet here, um, what we've been able to see over the, over the time period um, since 1980 is that the population grew by 41%. Um, the national economy, uh, very strong growth, um, six-fold growth over that time period. And yet total water use in the United States dropped by um, a whopping 26%. So we think that's a fascinating story. And for us, we had, we had the sense that a lot of this was probably explained by the changes in urban water use. Um, certainly there's other large water uses with thermoelectric power generation and with irrigated agriculture. Um, but we really wanted to drill in a little bit deeper and see whether or not we couldn't better understand what's been going on in cities across the United States and how much of the changes in their water use um, accounts for some of these some of these national trends that we're seeing. Click. So the first phase of our study, um, actually the first phase was, uh, we started to collect data from cities, municipalities all across the United States. And by the way, this, um, this research was quite difficult, I wanna, I wanna say, because there is no national mandate for municipalities, localities to report on their, on their public water supply, um, on the usage, on their service populations and that sort of thing. So this project literally involved contacting staff in each of the individual water utilities and asking or begging uh, for them to share some of their data. And so um, very, very difficult. Sometimes we had to request many, many times before we could get the information. Sometimes we had to file a Freedom of Information Act request in order to access some of this information. So we started out nationally, but one of the things that we immediately begin to understand is that because the story that we were wanting to look at had to do with this decoupling idea. In other words, we wanted to look at counties and municipalities in which two things were happening. The population was increasing, and at the same time, the water use was either staying stable or coming back down. And so we, we filtered um, with, with those two criteria in mind. And so that led us to a stronger emphasis or a stronger focus, I should say, on the Western United States. And you can see the stat there at the top of the slide. So um, among those counties that met those two criteria, increasing growth and stable or decreasing water use, uh, we found that two thirds of all the Western counties that had growing populations have been able to reduce their urban water use. 
So right out of the shoots, looking at the county, um, kind of the, the coarser scale level, um, we saw these very, very interesting um, indications that something interesting is going on. Click. So here's our first punchline. Um, and this was, this was uh, these results were published uh, in a paper at the end of 2020. I'll give you that citation at the end of the presentation here. Uh, but a very, very interesting that on average across all of these populations that we sampled, um, again, this was going directly to the water utilities themselves. We found that on average, their populations were, were growing by a little bit more than 20%. And yet at the same time, their water use not only didn't grow, but it dropped um, by 19%. And when we started to unpack that a little bit, we further um, gained the understanding that about two thirds of those reductions are attributable to lowered residential use. So it's what we're doing in our homes What's changed with water use in our homes that's really made the difference in this story? Click. So, as I said, we published the results from our Western US um, analysis of, of the water utilities there. Uh, but then our attention started to be drawn to the Colorado River Basin. And I think many of you um, in the audience today understand why that is. Um, it's, it's hard to go through a week now without seeing major news headlines about the water crisis that's been emerging in the Colorado River system. In a nutshell, what's been happening in the Colorado River system is that the total use of the water, the, the total consumption of the water has increased over time to the point where it now is repeatedly, the use of water is now repeatedly higher than the flow of water coming down through the Colorado River system. Um, as I say, that's been coming about for some time. The, the use has been increasing um, pretty steadily over time. And now all of a sudden we are repeatedly using more water in many years than is coming down through the river system. Now, well, the only way that you can do that, the only way demand can get above the supply is when you have really large water storage reservoirs. And so that's been the case for both Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, as of today, they are both about 70% depleted. Um, so 70% empty. And unfortunately that trend continues. Uh, we saw um, substantial reductions in the water volume in both of those large reservoirs in this year. Um, and it looks like next year is setting up to be an, another pretty bad year. By the way, these two reservoirs are the two largest water storage reservoirs in the United States. So this is, this is a really, really serious crisis. Um, I can't even hardly begin to tell you the, the impacts that this is already having. Um, on Lake Powell, for example, all of the boat marinas, 13 boat marinas closed this summer because of the water levels getting down to be too low. Uh, these two reservoirs generate a lot of hydropower electricity. And that hydropower generation is now down by almost 30%. And the reservoirs are getting to the point where they're approaching the point at which they won't be able to, um, the, the hydropower intakes will no longer be receiving water because the lake will have dropped down below those intakes, which means you turn, you're flipping the switch. You're turning off some of the largest electricity generators in the Southwestern United States. Uh, so the potential impact, the, the actual impacts and the potential impacts are mounting very rapidly. And there's a great deal of concern. Both the federal and the state governments are working on this 24 seven, trying to address this issue. So that's the setup for saying that our research now has shifted toward the water utilities that are dependent in part or in whole on the Colorado River's water. We wanted to understand what's going on with the, with the urban water uses in this river basin so that we could better understand the potential for bringing this river basin, the water use in this river basin back into a sustainable balance. And so we wanted to see the urban part of that story. Okay, click. So this is how the utilities that we've sampled um, are distributed. You can see from the, from the note at the bottom there, we have been successful in acquiring data uh, from more than 40 of the water utilities that use the Colorado River system in some way 
to some degree. And one of the interesting things about this map, which um, may be a little bit confusing to some of you at first blush, is that not all of the urban water use of the Colorado River um, exists within the geographical boundaries of the Colorado River system, of the Colorado River's watershed. So for instance, um, over there on the left, you see there's a lot of utilities in Southern California that are dependent upon the Colorado River. They bring it over by pipe and canal and pump um, to get it over the coastal mountain range out to, uh, the, to the West Coast. Um, up in the upper right, uh, what we call the front range cities of Colorado, Denver, Aurora, Colorado Springs, Boulder, Fort Collins, all of those cities are quite dependent upon diverting water out of the upper reaches of the Colorado River system and piping water through the Rocky Mountains to deliver to the front range cities. And then lastly, in the bottom right, um, over there you see, um, that's that dot is Albuquerque, New Mexico. So there's, there's another diversion um, out of one of the major tributaries of the Colorado River called the San Juan River, and they divert water out of the San Juan um, over into the, the Rio Grande Basin where Albuquerque utilizes that water. Okay, so, uh, so our, our sampling, our data acquisition involved, as I say, more than 40 utilities and their service populations total up to over 27 million residents. Now, we were quite pleased with that result because um, the estimate presently is that, that about 40 million people are dependent upon the Colorado River's water. So we're getting a, we're getting a good chunk of it um, in, our, in our work, in our research. Uh, click. Okay, so um, I'm going to share with you some, some early results from this work. We're working very, very hard to, to get this into a, a peer-reviewed paper and get it published in a journal. Um, but I'm going to be giving you a sneak preview here in a second on some of those results. But the key metrics that we were looking at in this, re in this research was um, not on here, but of course, how's the population, the service population of the utility changing over time? That's really, really key. Um, but then from the water standpoint, we wanted to know how many gallons are being used per person per day on average, what we call residential GPCD. Um, that's the term there. This is, and residential, of course, is again, this is in-home use. Um, it could be multi-density housing. It could be apartments. It could be single family residences, but that's all lumped under this residential uses. Then another metric we were looking at was total gallons per capita per day. And um, in this metric or in this variable, uh, what we're doing is we're taking all of the water that's being used for all purposes, whether it's in manufacturing or whether it's in um, uh, being used in public uh, landscape areas like golf courses or whether it's um, being used in commercial businesses. And so all of that gets lumped in the total water use and then you divide it by that same service population and you come up with this metric total gallons per capita per day, total GPCD. And then of course, we're also interested in um, how much water is being delivered overall? What's the total volume of water that's being delivered and how's that changing over time? Okay, click. Okay, so here is a sneak peek. My, my collaborators were quite nervous actually about um, the fact that uh, I'm sharing some of this early, these early results with you and the fact that it's being recorded. So please um, keep this in the house uh, for the time being. As I said, we'll, we'll try and get this out into press uh, within the next couple of weeks. I'm, I'm sorry, within the next couple of months. But here's, this is pretty phenomenal story here, as you can see. So the, the cities that are dependent upon the Colorado River um, are growing at a breakneck, breakneck speed. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, but we're also talking about those other cities, Denver, Colorado, Los Angeles, um, San Diego. And um, so cities big and small, um, but on average they're growing, uh, their growth is, is more than 31%. So that's that's pretty, now this is since 2000, by the way, this is an annual growth rate, of course. This is since the year 2000. And by the way, in our, in our efforts to collect data from these utilities, we were asking for the longest period of record that they were willing to provide to us, but at a minimum, 
um, we were we were pretty insistent that we needed data since 2000 so that at least we would have two decades of information to work with. But then on the right two boxes, you see how we're doing with um, the the water use, the average water use per person, whether you're looking at total or or just residential. Very impressive, very very impressive that they could that they could drop um, their rate of average per person water use by that much. Now, what I don't have yet to show you is how the total volume of water use has changed. Um, there's um, there's some way some some things that we're trying to work out with the way that that is reported. Um, but it is going to come out to be pretty impressive as well. Um, so they're not only holding the line and not increasing the total volume of use, but they're actually holding that stable or reducing. And I'm going to show you a couple slides for some of the cities that will illustrate the degree to which that is happening. So let's go ahead and click to the next slide. Okay. So um, these slides are a little bit complicated. There's a lot of information um, embedded in this, and I apologize for that. So let me just explain. I'm going to show you three slides from three different cities. And um, let me just show you what, and the color coding is the same in all of them. So the blue is the population growth um, over time. And again, each of these slides is set up from the year 2000 to the year 2020. The total volume of water deliveries is that orange line at the bottom. So you can see for Denver, it, it has actually decreased. Um, and uh, if the scaling was a little bit different, it's, it's pretty impressive, the degree to which Denver has been able to lower its overall water use. And the reason behind that is because the average use per person has dropped substantially. As you can see from the gray line, which is total uh, GPCD, and the yellow line, which is the residential GPCD. So again, pretty impressive results. Let's click and go to another another city, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so again, population growth there. Um, by the way, some of these cities really surprised us. We thought we had some data errors when we saw these drops in the pot in the service population. Well, that was the big crash, the big economic crash, and a lot of people lost their homes, moved out of these areas, and it's very pronounced in some places like Las Vegas, Nevada. But anyway, so population growth in Phoenix, you see down at the bottom, the orange line, decrease in total water use. And again, the trend lines there are the two GPCD lines in the middle. Um, so decreasing fairly, fairly steeply in a, to a very impressive degree. Okay, next slide, click. In Los Angeles, we have not yet been able to acquire their residential water use data. Um, we've been persistently asking for that for a couple of years. I think we're going to get it um, in the next couple of weeks. But here again, the story, um, increase in population there in the blue, um, decrease in the overall water use. Um, I do see that in, one, in the chat box, I'll go ahead and, and address this question. What percent of the total GPCD is residential? It tends to be about two thirds um, on average for most of these places. Now that varies greatly, of course, from city to city. It all depends upon, and it tends to be, the residential portion tends to be smaller in the larger cities. And that's because in the larger cities, you have more manufacturing, uh, more industrial production, more thermal electric hydro, I mean, thermal electric um, energy production, and that sort of thing, and also you know more golf courses, more commercial landscape areas, and that and all of that too. But on average, it's about just to give you some ballpark, it's about two thirds. So let's click, go to the next slide. Okay, so of course we're asking how in the world did this happen? So we. Um, fairly intensively surveyed each of these utilities and we examined all of their public documents. Um, so many of them have formal water conservation plans. Uh, many of them have long range water supply plans. We read everything that we could get our hands on. We looked at their websites. Um, we looked at any public presentations that they'd done. And we, and, but most importantly, most of our learning about the why here came from individual interviews with the, with the water utility staff. And so these were a couple of things that they that um, emerged as being the most important part 
of the explanation as to why they're able to lower their water use. Um, by far and away in municipal water use in the United States, one of the most single most important influences was the 1992 Energy Act. A lot of you might be scratching your head and saying, wait, what's the connection here? What's, what's the explanation? Well, the 1992 Energy Act, um, the architects of that act at the federal level very well understood the connections between water and energy use. So that what we call the water energy nexus. And so they understood that it takes a lot of energy to pull water out of a river or out of a groundwater aquifer and deliver it to the end users. Um, it has to go through a cleaning process and the water treatment process is very energy intensive. After the water gets used, it has to get treated again in wastewater treatment plants, a lot of energy use there. So the framers of the 1992 Federal Energy Act said, we need to cut water use in order to lower energy use across the United States. Brilliant, brilliant move. And so it's had a huge effect because one of the one of the one of the requirements or mandates in that Federal Energy Act was that we had to replace all of our plumbing fixtures, specifically toilets. Um, at that time, there was an awful lot of toilets that were using six gallons per flush, and they had to go to one and a half gallons. So a 75% reduction in toilet water consumption right off the top. But the federal act has also included some other plumbing fixtures, additional state um, acts have layered on additional requirements for washing machines and shower heads and dishwashers and that sort of thing. So anyway, all of that was really the policy move here was immensely important. And the calculation has been done that it lowered indoor water use across the United States um, by, by an average of 15%. Let's click and go to the next slide. But very, very important is also what's going on with use outside of the homes or outside of the businesses, the outdoor landscaping area. Um, in the Western US, that outdoor water use is very commonly 50, 60% of the total water use within the home or in the business. And surprisingly, there are many parts of the Eastern US um, where it's not far off of that, actually. In fact, the calculations have been done that across the United States, it's, it's average is about a half of water use um, within cities is going to outdoor landscaping. And so if you can figure out some way to lower that outdoor landscaping, you're taking away, you know, you're dealing with half of the water use in the cities. So there's been, there's been a lot of innovations. And I really want to give a shout out here to Las Vegas of all places. I think a lot of you might think, oh my gosh, Las Vegas has to be one of the most profligate, wasteful water users in the United States. I mean, you go there and you visit, they've got, they've got fountains, you know, spouting off, um, you know, all over the place, a lot of, you know, outdoor water features and that sort of thing. But they have been extremely successful and aggressive in their water conservation program. So for example, one of the things that they've done is they offered homeowners and business owners, um, they paid them on a square foot basis to rip out their green grass lawns and put in landscape vegetation that was far less water intensive, in many cases, utilizing native species, but certainly zero escape species as, as, or drought tolerant species as they're, they're referred to. And just that one move alone enabled Las Vegas to drop their residential water use by about 21%. Um, over a few years time and it, it can, has continued to stay down there. By the way, they pay about $3 per square foot presently. So it's quite an incentive for the homeowners and they've seen, they've had great success in seeing the homeowners ripping out those, those green grass lawns. Um, overall, Las Vegas' performance over the last decade has been very impressive. They've reduced their total water use by about a third. Click, next slide. Now, because I'm, I'm making a point about this outdoor landscaping, um, and by the way, I forgot to say this at the top of the presentation, everything that I'm saying here is highly relevant to the Eastern US as well. I, I hope that was obvious to everybody listening in here. Um, and, and that reminds me of this because um, stormwater harvesting, uh, rainwater harvesting, 
uh, collecting the water that falls on your roof area or perhaps within um, impervious surfaces, you know, around your home or your business somehow and collecting that water and reusing it to, for, for in particular here, I'm talking about reusing it for your outdoor landscape watering um, can be very, very significant. So I have personal experience with this. Uh, we installed a big cistern um, at our home in Crozet, Virginia, outside of, outside of Charlottesville. And we collect uh, rainwater off of a portion of our roofs and we utilize that rainwater to irrigate um, our vegetable gardens, our flower gardens, you know, and, and, and other, you know, plant species, you know, in our, in our yard. And it has enabled us to virtually completely eliminate having to use any of our potable water um, outdoors. And so I think this is equally applicable in the Eastern US as it is in the West. And the potential here is very large. If half the water is being used outdoors, we could really cut urban water use um, very substantially. So let's click and go to the next slide. So as we sampled across these 40 different water utilities um, utilizing the Colorado River, and we're looking at what are their strategies that they're using, this shows you what the most common strategies were. So um, there's a trend here again between big and small. So smaller towns and cities, they don't have the financial resources, they don't have the staff capacity to do really sophisticated water conservation measures, but virtually all of them, almost 90% of them are doing some kind of education and outreach about water use and trying to get their, their residents, their citizens to try to be more careful with their water use. But more than 80% of them have, have, a, have been able to, um, to do something about plumbing fixtures. And, and specifically in most cases, this is um, providing a financial rebate on the toilets so, so I mentioned the 1992 Energy Act mandated that all new toilets that were being sold were going to be far less water um, guzzlers. So dropping again from six gallons down to one and a half. Now, most of the toilets are down to 1.2 gallons per flush. But there's a problem for many cities, particularly older cities, that there's a lot of home stock um, where they still have those water guzzling toilets and other water guzzling washing machines and dishwashers. And so many cities, um, including many cities in Virginia, of course, are providing financial rebates for their citizens to, to take out those old fixtures and replace them with more water efficient fixtures to great excess, uh, great success. And so you see here more than 80% of the utilities that we surveyed are doing that. Landscape, um, again, financial rebates in many, many cases, um, changing their pricing structure. So rather than a flat rate per unit of water, um, they are now doing tiered uh, rates, tiered structured rates, where the more water you use, the more you're having to pay per unit of water. And that's been a very effective tool for a lot of these cities and a lot of these utilities. Um, and you see some of the others there. Um, Rainwater storage, I'm going to come back to this. So, you know, about a third are trying to, to incentivize or encourage rainwater capture in some way. Um, but there's, there's much, much more potential there. And I'll highlight that here in just a moment. Okay, click on the next slide. Now, the one other thing that's been really important, um, and again, I think this has um, a considerable applicability in some of the eastern cities as well, when you're over utilizing a particular water source, in this case for these utilities, it's the Colorado River, um, it can be very important to help them find ways to use what's called alternative water sources, okay? If you're living in the West Coast of the United States, many of those cities, particularly the larger ones, are talking about desalination, taking ocean water and going through the desalination process or technology to produce some fresh water. It's a very expensive technology and it has some, it has some real challenges, but um, as you can see here, more than 10% more than of the utilities that we sampled are doing that. Stormwater capture, now this isn't just for use in outdoor areas. There are a number of cities, and I think Los Angeles really stands out here. Those of you that are interested in, in this kind of a strategy, Los Angeles is doing industrial scale stormwater capture. Um, by that, I mean large um, detention and retention ponds, 
uh, infiltration basins, getting that stormwater back into groundwater recharge, and then subsequently pumping the groundwater and putting it into their potable drinking water supply. Um, so that's an alternative way, and it helps to begin to help them wean themselves off of the Colorado River. Um, and similarly in recycled water, this is immensely important. And you can see more than, you know, about two thirds of the cities are actually implementing pretty aggressive recycled water programs now. Um, very few of them going into potable drinking water, but they're taking their process treated wastewater and they're then using that outdoor for their outdoor landscaping, trying to offset that half of the, of the urban water use in that manner. Um, but some of them are going all the way and, and really see their future as being very dependent upon being able to treat um, that water, the, re the, the wastewater to a um, potable drinking water um, standard. Okay, so weaning yourself off is, can be, is becoming as important as water conservation of reducing your total use. Okay, go ahead, please click. Okay. So our punchline, of course, what does this all mean and why does it matter? Well, very importantly, um, it turns out that cities across the United States are proving that they can, they can accommodate, in the case of the Western U.S., pretty substantial increase in their service populations, and yet they can do that without increasing their total water use. Um, this is an incredible good news story. And again, I want to remind you that it's not just about taking the pressure off of water supply or finding new water supplies and that sort of thing. It's about reducing our impact on existing water supply sources, reducing our use in Charlottesville on the Rivanna River, um, that sort of thing. It's very, very important. Um, but it's also about energy use. So what I, what I like to tell my students is to remind them that even though water conservation might not be the primary interest that, you know, the city is not really experiencing water supply stress, um, they, can, they can reduce the energy use within the city by reducing their water use. And so because of that linkage again between water and energy. Okay, click. Uh, there is tremendous potential to do more. Um, across the United States. Um, I think there's, this is the good news. The bad news is that there's still a lot of cities and counties that are using, look at the stats there at the bottom, um, more than 300 gallons per person per day. Um, that's, that's high. In fact, I would, I would say, I would editorialize and say that's ridiculous. Um, and there's a lot of, but there's a lot of potential to do better. So ironically, in, in this map, you see counties, this is done at the county level, you see counties that are immediately adjacent to each other, and one county is using more than 300 gallons per capita per day, and the adjacent county is using under 100, less than a third. Of the, and it's actually more extreme. When you, get, when you get down to smaller and smaller spatial resolution, you see a 5x five, five differential between adjacent cities next door. So um, the underperformers need to get on board, and we need to see, you know, we need to get, you know, we need to certainly get under 100 gallons across the map. Okay, click. Um, and here's some of the reasons that I'm very optimistic about our, our potential. So we have not run out of running room um, in this water conservation story. So again, going back to the plumbing fixtures, only half of American homes have efficient plumbing fixtures. So there's tremendous potential savings here to get all of those old fixtures out of the houses. Um, across the US, we could save 18% of indoor water use just by, by achieving that standard of getting all homes up, up to current standards. By comparison, Australian homes are 86% across the country, just to give you like an indication of, of comparison. Next click. Leak detention repair, always a problem, um, particularly in the older cities, you know, very, very old pipes and, and a lot of leaks going on. Uh, it's been estimated that about 14% of indoor use uh, could be resolved um, by by getting better with leak detection. And many of the city, cities that we surveyed are doing a pretty darn good job. Um, very, very sophisticated detection systems um, being put into place. And, and aggressively, city of Denver, um, you know, counts their success in tens of miles um, of pipe repaired, you know, per year. Okay, next click. 
Outdoor watering, you know, we've talked about that, um, but just getting better, not going to like complete removal of, um, of potable water use, but across the board, just by being more careful with outdoor watering, it's been estimated nationwide that we could save another 16%. Next click. And lastly, I wanted to hit on this, this stormwater capture. I'm pretty big on this actually. I think there's a lot of potential from policy changes at the municipal level um, to somehow incentivize uh, the installation of, of rainwater cisterns. Uh, and this is more than rain barrels, by the way. This is the cistern that I installed in our house is 600 gallons, just to give you some point of comparison. Uh, many of the ones out in the Western cities like Tucson, they're up to a thousand or 2000 gallons of stormwater capture. Um, and, and you need to right size it according to how much, you know, the, the natural rainfall patterns in your area. But um, in Australia, more than 40% of the homes have, have aggressive rainwater capture programs, and it's less than 5% in the U.S. So again, you know, a lot of potential there to get off the potable water supply for outdoor use. Okay, click. Um, just, you know, a quick summary here. Um, what I see on the future horizon in the next decade or two, lots of room to run on conservation. We're gonna see huge increases in water recycling, water reuse, stormwater capture is coming on. Um, there's some leaders in the country like the city of Los Angeles, as I mentioned, pricing um, becoming more and more uniformly used across the United States, the tiered rate structures, and eventually desalinization, desalination for some cities. If you've maxed out on all these other things, um, like some cities have done, in the Western US, then desal becomes, even though it's very expensive, it becomes a viable option or a desirable option um, once you've exhausted the potential of, of these other things. One last click, I think. Oh, um, maybe there's one more left. So I just wanted to mention this for those of you that work um, in municipal governments, uh, county level, uh, locality, you know, there was a very, very interesting program done by the Alliance for Water Efficiency, a nationwide um, water conservation, urban water conservation organization. And they created a model ordinance. Um, you can pull it off the shelf and then customize it to your local, your, your local municipality. Um, and they call it Net Blue. And the, the quick summary of this, the simple summary of this is that basically what these policy ordinances say is that any new development, whatever the net increase in water use is going to be, um, commercial areas, residential areas, the developer of, of those um, developments is going to be required to fully offset their water need by helping to subsidize um, these other water conservation measures in existing homes and businesses. So paying for toilet replacements, paying for installation of rainwater cisterns and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not gonna elaborate on this in, in the interest of time, but um, this might be of interest to a lot of you and it's equally applicable again across the United States. And I think there's a lot of potential there for communities that really want to try to stabilize their water use um, in a sustainable manner going forward over the long term. Okay, now the last click. So, um, that's what I have, uh, for my presentation. There's my email address. If any of you want to follow up with me directly, please do. This is the one paper that we published at the end of last year, um, published in the international journal called water. And, uh, again, we have our new paper about the Colorado river utilities, um, coming out hopefully within the next couple of months. So thank you. And I'm open and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Brian. It was, uh, uh, really informative. Uh, I work in the water industry myself, so a lot of your topic is uh, hits pretty close to home. Um, we do have about 10 minutes for a question and answer. Uh, if you have something that you wanted to share about um, with what you've just heard, please use the chat box uh, to submit your question or comment. Thanks, and we already have a few questions um, in the chat box. So the first one, um, speaking to rainwater harvesting, some of the Western states really restrict the amount of stormwater that you can harvest. So are you seeing, is there a change um, 
at the federal level starting to loosen these restrictions so that we can actually, you know, increase the stormwater harvesting in the areas? Yeah, terrific question. Uh, spot on. And um, it really caught some news headlines a few years ago when it became um, evident that the state of Colorado uh, prohibited the use of rainwater capture um, because of the nature of the water rights system out there. So all water uses eventually are are authorized through the issuance of a water rights, um, an entitlement to use a certain volume of water. Um, but the public outcry, the public backlash on that prohibition was so strong that the state backed off and said, you know, this is de minimis effect on total water supply, um, you know, for other uses. And so they said, in fact, um, the argument was made that uh, by this rainwater capture is helping to reduce other problems with stormwater runoff, of course, which is overtaxing our, um, our, our uh, water collection systems. It's uh, eroding our local streams because of too much water getting in too quickly. It's causing us a lot of problems with having to invest in detention and retention uh, programs and that sort of thing. So they started to see that, look, there's actually a benefit here. There's a, there's a public benefit to having residents capture some of their rainwater and putting it out in their outdoor landscaping. So it is an issue, um, but I think there's um, th there's a lot of movement and a lot of um, precedence for pushing back on that and getting the state to, to back off of that at the state level. That is very excellent news. Um, another question, is there a good public facing version of that gallons per person map that uh, folks could see? Uh, you know, I'm very happy to share it with anybody who wants. Um, by the way, the data, it should have had a note below the map. That data comes right out of the USGS five-year water use accounting reports. Um, that was, as you saw, it was taken from 2015. Um, I believe that you can do that map for 2020 now. But basically, it was just taking for each of the counties where you had um, total public water supply reported at the county level, total water, public water supply or use at the county level, along with an estimate of the population within that county, reported through the USGS water use accounting reports. And so we just took the USGS data and created that map. So I'm happy to share it with you. You could recreate it your own if you wanted to access that data directly through USGS, but I'm very happy to provide it um, at my email address for anybody that's interested in those data. Not all, the, the reason there's a lot of blank spots in that map, by the way, is because there were many counties who did not report either the population or the public water supply um, use of water. Well, that's a good segue to the next question is that, is there something that we could do to encourage those localities to start either gathering the data or reporting it in some better accessible way? Oh boy, I love that question. Um, you know, after, go, you know, I, I, I could go on and on about how difficult and frustrating it was to collect this, these data from these water utilities. Um, we were pulling teeth. Um, and we were pulling out our own hair trying to get these data. And it's ridiculous that you have to go through a FOIA you know, process to get it out of some of these utilities. There really needs to be a mandate, and I believe it needs to be at the federal level, um, for reporting, for consistent reporting across the board. And that would be not just at the local water utility level, but also at the county level, um, appointed to county governments. And given all the interest in water and energy use in this country, it's ridiculous that we don't have some kind of federal standards, um, some consistency in that reporting so that all of us could do this kind of a study, you know, just by going online and downloading those data. Great. Um, are there any environmental concerns associated with the brine byproduct of desalinization? Yeah, Zach, thanks for the question. There certainly is. Um, I kind of skipped over it because I was trying to not overuse my time allocation, but thanks for asking. So I mentioned the problem with cost. So this process of desalinization is extremely electricity intensive and the electricity costs a lot. And so 
that water becomes expensive water. It's about 10 times more than, than other water supply sources, like direct extractions of water out of a river or a groundwater aquifer. Um, but there are other problems. There are two other problems, Zach, that I'll highlight here. Um, one is the one that you bring up. So when you run a gallon of water through the desalination process, you end up with a half a gallon of fresh water and a half a gallon of very, very salty, concentrated brine solution. And you have to figure out how to dispose of that brine solution in an environmentally safe and appropriate manner. Now, if you're on the coast, uh, typically what's done is they run, so they're not only pulling water in to the plant from the ocean, but they then send another parallel pipe way out into the ocean with diffusers on it so that they diffusely um, disperse that brine solution back out in the ocean. Other more inland cities are doing it by pumping some of the brine back into um, saline aquifers, underground aquifers, as a way of disposing of it. But it's tough and it's, and it's restricted a lot of cities. That's an expensive process. You know, however, disposal of the brine is expensive. The one last thing, Zach, though, that I want to highlight here is because it's an energy intensive process, um, that has serious consequences for climate change, right? So whether you're doing desalinization or water reuse and water recycling, to the extent that we can get off of carbon emitting sources of energy to run those processes, um, the less, of course, that we're going to be impacting the climate and getting out of this vicious cycle of using <laughs> fossil fuel energy sources to develop our water supply, which is changing our climate and affecting our water supply. So you got to get, we got to get out of this vicious, vicious cycle here. Thank you. Um, one last question that I have is, does this research hold true in suburban or rural environments, or are you seeing this trend in just kind of the urban city um, landscapes? Are there additional challenges that might present itself in the suburban and rural environment? It's a really good question, Liz. It's really pertinent to this study that we're working on on the Colorado River uh, utilities right now. Um, there tends to be a much stronger success within the urban um, who are on, you know, the public distribution systems in particular. Uh, much stronger success with, with, with reducing or stabilizing their water use. Um, there's a real issue with, with unincorporated areas that are out in kind of suburbia, um, the outskirts of Phoenix, for example, or, you know, Las Vegas, um, because they're not under sort of a central distribution system, they're not under the same control or influence of a water utility or a water authority. And so it's been harder to get them, um, to move, you know, in the right direction. Um, and also going back, Liz, to the point I made earlier about there is a difference, and we're going to we're going to analyze further analyze and, and write about this in our paper between small and large. So the smaller you are, if you're out in the suburbs, you know it's going to be if there is any sort of a water youth, water authority or water utility out there, they're tending to be smaller. Um, they probably don't have a full time water conservation person on staff. Um, and contrast that with places like San Antonio, Texas, which has full-time staff of more than 30 people working on water conservation alone. So, so not, not surprisingly, we do see a difference um, between small and large. Great question. Great. Thank you. Well, I think that concludes our session, so I'll turn it back to you, James. Oh, thanks, Liz. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, wonderful presentation. A lot of uh, great content and uh, response uh, to our questions. Uh, we really also wanted to express our appreciation for you to serve as our keynote speaker for today. My pleasure, Thank, thanks for the invitation. Certainly. Uh, our next presentation is by uh, Aaron Porter on spatial and temporal patterns in stream flow, water chemistry, and benthic macroinvertebrates of the streams of Fairfax County. Uh, I actually come from Fairfax County, so uh, this presentation is uh, pretty exciting for me. Uh, Aaron is a hydrologist and project chief for the U U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, he works at the Virginia and West Virginia Water Science Center in Richmond. Aaron has been involved in a wide variety of USGS water resource investigations since 2014, 
His primary focus has been in utilizing stream flow and continuous water quality monitoring data. The goal of his work is to improve the R understanding of nutrient and sediment dynamics in and loadings from small urban watersheds. Aaron currently oversees long-term monitoring efforts in urban streams in Fairfax County, Hampton Roads, Salem, Roanoke, Reston, where I come from actually, and Ashland. So the USGS would like to expand its effort in urban streams throughout Virginia. And Aaron uh, recorded his presentation prior to today's conference and we will view it now. All right, well, uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Aaron Porter. Uh, I'm a hydrologist with the US, uh, USGS Virginia and West Virginia uh, Water Science Center located uh, right here in Richmond. Uh, so today I'm going to be discussing our long term urban monitoring program in Fairfax County. Um, but before I get going on all that, I just want to thank you all for, for accommodating this virtual presentation. Um, so I've got a a pregnant wife at home who is due any day now. So I'm just trying to stay nearby. Um, so I appreciate the accommodation. Um, before I get into the details of the program, I'll first just set the stage for why Fairfax County has joined up with USGS to conduct this work. Um, so first off, you know, as is, is the case in most urban suburban areas, uh, Fairfax County streams are suffering from many of the common symptoms of urban stream syndrome, such as um, stress to aquatic communities, stream erosion, increased sedimentation and nutrient loading, and flooding issues. Um, in response to these issues, the county has made significant investments um, to improve the health of these streams um, and has done this to comply with, of course, local, state, and federal regulations and TMDLs, uh, such as the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Um, since 2009, they've invested over $100 million on an array of watershed management implementations um, and our monitoring is being used to detect changes in various stream health metrics um, in response to these implementations. And we're doing this to provide it, the insight um, you know, into how to best direct future investments. So monitoring began uh, back in 2007, um, and the study objectives can best be described in, in two ongoing phases. Uh, so number one is just to generate long-term monitoring data to describe basic water quality conditions, uh, compute trends, compute nutrient and sediment yields, um, and monitor stream health um, using benthic macroinvertebrate community metrics. Uh, the first phase is the bedrock of this program, and it is ongoing to this day. Um, so we're almost to, 20, to uh, 15 years now. Um, but these data are also used to satisfy the second objective. Uh, which is to transfer what we've learned to less intensively monitor watersheds and also to evaluate uh, relations between the observed conditions in a combination of things like BMP implementations, um, public works infrastructure, uh, changes in land use and land cover, and changes in climate. So our approach to monitoring is based on two tiers of monitoring intensity. Um, and the network consists of, of 20 stations of um, five of which are what we call intensively monitored, uh, which are the blue triangles on the map. So at those stations, we're collecting continuous measurements of stream flow and water quality parameters, and we're utilizing um, automatic samplers to collect nutrient and sediment storm samples. We refer to the other 15 stations as trend sites. Um, those are the red triangles, and at these locations, we collect continuous water level data, um, and each month we visit the sites to collect nutrient and sediment uh, grab samples um, and water quality parameters. Um, so these sites are primarily used to compute trends in water quality constituents. And then at all 20 of the sites, um, Fairfax County ecologists collect benthic macroinvertebrate samples biannually um, in the spring and the fall. And just to note, these, these 20 watersheds range in size from around one to five square miles. Um, and the county spans three unique physiographic regions. Um, so the coastal plain to the east, the Piedmont through the center and the majority of the county, and a subprovince of the Piedmont, which is the Triassic lowlands to the west. Um, and this is important because these uh, unique features of these geologic terrains 
um, can affect water quality and stream flow. Um, okay, so now I want to share some data analyses that were presented in our most recent publication back in 2020. Um, so we conducted a comprehensive analysis of stream flow characteristics across the network that included uh, metrics like base flow separations, um, flow duration curves, annual exceedance probabilities, um, <clears throat> precipitation runoff relations, uh, stream flashiness, um, and trends in stream flow. Uh, given the limited time today, I thought this would be a nice figure to share because it, it really encapsulates, sorry, encapsulates um, how hydrology has changed in the county over, um, over the long term. So what I'm showing here are two long-term stream gauges that are not actually part of the monitoring network. Um, they're part of the Chesapeake Bay Non-Tidal Network um, that many of you are probably uh, aware of. And um, they're both in, within the county of Fairfax um, and are operated by my team. Um, they have records dating back uh, to the 1940s. For each site, I'm um, presenting the base flow index, so the percentage of flow from groundwater discharges, and the runoff ratio, which is the percentage of precipitation uh, that ran, runs directly overland to the stream. Uh, for both of these sites, we see that the base flow index has steadily declined over time, and the runoff ratio has increased. Now, this is, this is a classic response to developmental pressure. Um, so more impervious cover, more channelization, you know, it's going to decrease groundwater infiltration and consequently lead to increases in runoff. Um, so the results are lower base flows that are needed to sustain aquatic life and higher peak flows, which is, of course, going to increase erosion. So now let's look at uh, specific conductance um, because stream salinization is a very important concern getting a lot of attention right now. Um, and we spent a good deal of time focusing on, on this subject in the report. So um, in this first plot to the left, we see variability across both sites and seasons. I have all 20 sites here and I've split the data into two seasons. So the cool season is denoted by the blue box plot for each site and the warm uh, by the red. So the takeaway here is that across all sites, um, SC was higher in the cool months and significantly higher in the Triassic lowland sites and the Piedmont or the coastal plain sites. Um, also important to mention, conductance was higher in watersheds with high impervious cover. Um, and this was especially true in the cool season, the cool months. Um, so, you know, we have seasonal differences. Um, we have differences across an impervious gradient and we have differences across physiographic uh, regions. On this next figure, I'm showing the conductance flow relation for the five intensively monitored stations. So um, those sites with the continuous 15-minute um, data. Um, and for each site, I'm showing the warm season on the left and the cool season on the right. Um, now, conductance, you know, typically is going to decrease with increasing stream flow as relatively high conductance groundwater becomes diluted by relatively low precipitation runoff. Um, and this is clearly the case in the warm season, which is going to show it on the left of this figure. But on the right side, we see or we can find that conductance um, in many cases actually increases with flow. And this occurs in the winter months when de-icing salts are applied to the roadways and then are washed off during snow melt, uh, periods of snow melt or subsequent rain events. So in keeping with, with conductance for a moment, um, I'm presenting the trends across the network here. So on the map, you can see the upward facing orange triangles indicating increasing trends in, in SC across the network. Um, and in the bar chart to the left, it's the average annual percent change at each station. So conductance increased by about two and a half percent per year on average, which equates out to about a seven and a half unit per year increase. And the largest increases occur in watersheds with the most impervious cover. Um, and these trends are again likely related to increased use of road salts and then the increased delivery of those salts to streams by um, increased overland runoff. So one more slide on conductance here. Um, so the, the trend method that we employed allows not only to, us to not only calculate the long-term annual trend, but also the annual trend with, within each month. Um, you know, so for example, how has conductance, specific conductance changed over 
10 years in the month of January versus the month of February versus March and so on. Um, and interestingly, we found that the significant increases at these stations were um, most consistently observed in the spring and the fall months, not actually in the winter uh, when the de-icing salts were being applied. Um, so this suggests that the salt that's, that's being applied is hanging around in the environment and being conveyed to the streams by the subsequent events. Um, so, you know, in other words, the soil may be uh, quite saturated with these salts. Um, you know, so in the springtime, spring storms are going to convey that salt that's applied the previous winter. In the fall, you know, we typically have droughts in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, so you, you get older groundwater discharging to streams, and that may contain chloride that's um, slowly moved downward toward, you know, through the soil matrix over time. Um, or, or perhaps remobilization of, of salt storages by those large fall storms like uh, hurricanes and tropical storms. All right, so I'll transition now to discuss some of the things we learned about phosphorus. Um, we first of all, we found that concentrations were significantly higher in the Triassic lowland sites than these other um, two physiographic regions. Uh, phosphorus concentrations were also seasonally dependent, um, so we observed higher concentrations in the warm months and the cool months. Um, and we attributed this primarily to two factors, and they're kind of inter interwoven factors. So, uh, first off, we have the the depend, uh, temperature dependent release of orthophosphate from sediments. Um, so in other words, orthophosphate is released at a, at a greater rate in, in warmer waters. Um, so that's important to keep in mind as we consider the effects of climate change. Um, number two, which again is, is kind of related to one, uh, dissolved oxygen concentrations are at their lowest in the summer months. Um, and these, con these, uh, these conditions can cause uh, these phosphorus ions to disassociate from the metals and the organic matter um, that they were previously bound to. Now on the right, uh, I'm presenting the phosphorus stream flow relation uh, for each of these five intensity modern sites. Um, and we see that phosphorus concentrations increase with flow um, and the composition of the total phosphorus also, also changes. Um, so the compositional change is indicated by the color change in, the, in those points, uh, which signals a shift from dissolved P um, as lower flow at lower flows to particulate bound P at higher flows. And the the increase in total phosphorus um, with flow highlights that dominance of particulate bound uh, phosphorus in these watersheds. So phosphorus mobilization is closely tied to sediment mobilization. Um, now, bouncing back to our trend analysis, so phosphorus increased in most streams, um, but those trends were only significant at four sites. So that's at Captain Hickory, Castle Creek, uh, Indian Run, and Paul Spring Bridge, uh, where you see the orange bars and the triangle, orange triangles. Um, and concentrations actually decreased at Frog Branch, which, um, by the way, is the site at which we measure the highest median concentration over this time period. So that's very good to see. Um, why that is, we're still working to figure out. Uh, it's important to point out that phosphorus levels were generally low, um, and these increases were only about 0 0.01 milligrams per liter, uh, but they were primarily due to increases in orthophosphate. Um, and though, you know, that's very low, that's still an important finding because um, small increases in orthophosphate can have, of course, very significant impacts on stream health since they are a key limiting nutrient in these freshwater streams. All right, so now on to nitrogen. Um, so over this 10-year period, uh, we see a generally positive picture um, with decreasing concentrations mixed with a few sites showing increases. Um, in our regional trend analysis, which, which basically just leverages all the data from all the sites, um, what we found was we found total nitrogen um, hasn't really changed much. Um, but this is because of increasing trends in nitrate are being offset by decreasing uh, trends in the organic component. Um, so as I mentioned, we're seeing increasing trends at a few of these sites. Um, the two I want to make note of are at South Fork Little Difficult Run, uh, where total nitrogen and nitrate both increased, and then Captain Hickory Run, um, where TN uh, didn't increase, you know, statistically speaking, but, but nitrate did. Um, and both of those are both of those watersheds are sub-basins of the difficult run watershed. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with Fairfax County, 
Um, you know, that's that is a watershed that's been very well studied by, by a number of different researchers over the last 10, 15 years. An important factor um, that those two watersheds have in common are a very high density of septic system infrastructure. Um, those systems show up, so the septic systems show up on the map um, here as the brown dots. And this relation, um, you know, it has been linked to, to higher industry nitrate concentrations in um, not only in this study, but in several other studies of difficult run, the difficult run watershed as well. And in the bottom right, I'm showing a regression of median nitrate concentration and septic density. Um, and while you know the relation isn't perfect, uh, we can see that there is a pretty strong correlation between these two variables. Um, but you know, caveat, you know, there are obviously other you know important driving forces. Um, in the county affecting in-stream nitrate like point source discharges, um, fertilizer inputs, um, and also very likely variability in soil denitrification potential. So we computed annual loads of sediment, phosphorus, and nitrogen constituents. Um, so both the totals and the subcomponents of the dissolved and particulate uh, components at the five intensively monitored watersheds. Um, you know, given time constraints here, I'm just going to share a little bit about the sediment and phosphorus loads. So uh, what we're seeing here are the, the cumulative yields, so the area normalized loading rate um, over the over this study period, this 10 year period. Um, so the first thing to note is that difficult run and South Fork Little Difficult, which are the, the blue and the green lines, um, and I remember are the two sub uh, watersheds in the greater, the, the greater difficult run watershed. Um, these two yielded substantially more sediment than the others over this 10 year period. Um, looking at the next, the, the bottom um, pane, uh, you know, given what we know about elevated phosphorus concentrations in the Triassic lowlands, um, it wasn't a surprise to find that Flatlick Branch, um, which is the orange line, um, yielded substantially more phosphorus than the other watersheds. So this, this is the only uh, of the five continuous intensively monitored watersheds that is in the, the Triassic lowlands. Now I've brought in those red, uh, the red ovals here to highlight the effect of intense storm events on sediment um, and, and on phosphorus loadings, which you can see in these major step increases um, that occurred during the, the three largest storm events um, that occurred over this time period, that was these 10 years. Um, and it, you know, it's really shocking that, for example, at South Fork Little Difficult, um, which again is the green line. So if we look at the green line on the top pane, 60% um, of the sediment load generated over that entire 10 year period at South Fork Little Difficult was generated from only three storm events. Um, and so, you know, that of course is going to have some direct management implications, um, you know, when considering how to manage this watershed to, to reduce sediment load. All right, so for anyone familiar with the turbidity streamflow hysteresis analysis, um, you'll know that those relations can be used to infer, you know, the source of sediment loadings to a stream, uh, at least can, can be one line of evidence. Um, so what I'm presenting here is a cross correlation analysis um, that we use to explore hysteresis patterns across many storms simultaneously, um, determine you know, whether or not there's a pattern occurring at that site or across sites. So if you think about a time series plot of both just flow and turbidity um, during a storm like the one um, to the right, you know, they don't always peak at the same time. So when per turbidity peaks before stream flow, um, that's suggestive of a source of sediment that's nearby the stream or nearby the monitoring station, such as from um, the stream bed or the lower banks. Um, and in the main figure here, um, that's going to express itself as a little blue dot that is falling to the or tailing to the right. Now, if turbidity peaks after flow, like in the bottom left, um, then that tells us sources may be further away from the monitoring point, um, such as in the floodplain or in the upland areas of the watershed. So it takes longer to get there. And that expresses itself in the, in the main figure here as values that are tailing to the left. 
So uh, we ran this analysis on a select number of storms in each of these watersheds and found that um, most of the values peaked within one hour of stream flow. You know, so that tells us that in general, uh, across these five sites, sediment is, is really well correlated to stream flow. So as, as flow increases, so does sediment transport. That makes sense. Um, but we also see some spatial variability here. So at difficult run and at flat like branch, um, the values in some of these storms have a tendency to tail to the right. And that's suggestive that, that the source may be, you know, within the stream channel, like um, uh, mobilization of bed material or scour of, of the lower banks. Um, and it's mobilized on the on the rising limb of the storm. Um, but at South Fork, a little difficult, dead run and long branch, the three other watersheds here, um, there are more storms in which the, the values are tailing to the left, um, suggesting that Transport here is from floodplains or in the upland areas. Um, so now I'm shifting gears away from water chemistry. Um, and here we have results from our trend analyses of 20 benthic macroinvertebrate metrics. Um, and these metrics, even more than our, our nutrient sediment and water quality parameters, um, can give us a, an indication of stream health um, because these insects have to you know, actually live and survive in these streams. Um, you know, I've heard on numerous occasions heard them called uh, living recorders um, because of their relative relative immobility, um, you know, and because they're, they're variable sensitivity to, to different stressors. Um, now, the big takeaway message from this analysis is that the changes that we observed in our 20 benthic metric uh, metrics suggest that um, the condition and the function and the biodiversity of streams in Fairfax County is improving. Um, but many of these improvements are from a greater number of organisms that are tolerant of urban stressors. Uh, so, you know, instead of going back to where we were pre-development, you know, perhaps we're establishing a new, a new urban normal. So just to quickly walk through this figure, I'll highlight a few, a few important um, areas here. Um, I'll, I'll say first that these are, these are trend results at the network scale. So this is trends that are incorporating data from all of our 20 sites, uh, or sorry, all of our 14 sites that had a long enough record to, to conduct trends on. And we find that the, um, the total number of unique species has increased. Um, but as I mentioned, much of the, of the gain was from our more tolerant organisms, um, many of which fall into this cote metric. So most people are familiar with EPT, um, which is used to measure the more pollutant, um, pollution sensitive organisms. Um, well, Cote incorporates um, the mayflies and the caddisflies from EPT, um, but includes the, the odonates, so the dragonflies, and the uh, coleroptera, um, the beetles, um, that are more tolerant of urban environments, since you know, many um, urban streams just can't support uh, plecropterans, um, you know, the stoneflies. We also found that the Fairfax IBI increased. Um, so most sites went from this quality of store, score of, of poor to fair, um, and some from fair to good. And the change in IBI was, was not only, but largely driven by a decrease in dominance. Um, so the community became less homogenous um, due to a, a decrease in the, the, the very utmost tolerant organisms. Um, all right, so the previous slide was a quick summary of the benthic analyses as it pertains to the network wide trends, obviously leveraging all of the data together from all sites, but we also performed all these analyses for each individual station. Um, and those analyses yielded some, some pretty interesting results. So now in this figure, I'm presenting the, uh, the trend lines for the Fairfax County IBI. And an interesting takeaway here can be seen by comparing Castle Creek and South Fork for the difficult. Um, so the trends at South Fork Little Difficult, which is the blue line, are similar to most sites in the network. And they show um, moderate recovery, you know, following uh, many decades of disturbance. Uh, meanwhile, the conditions at Castle Creek, which is the least developed watershed in the network, uh, were initially the best in the network and had an IBI score in the excellent range, um, much like a reference site. But uh, due to some development in that watershed, um, the abundance of more tolerant organisms increased. And IBI is showing um, a non-significant but declining path. Um, and it was accompanied by um, significant declines in the percent EPT, um, which again is the most sensitive taxa. Um, and it increases in the more tolerant taxa. 
Uh, another interesting note is that the sites with a better starting condition at the beginning of the study were more likely to decline over that period, um, likely to develop no pressures, um, you know, whereas sites with poor, very poor spores were more likely to improve um, as they began to stabilize, you know, after some intense disruption in the previous decades. All right, so um, running out of time here, but I presented some of the, the results from the first 10 years of monitoring, uh, but I mentioned at the top that we want to link what we have, what we've learned um, at each of these monitoring stations to changes throughout the watershed, um, you know, in order to help the county meet their water quality goals. Um, so we ask ourselves, you know, what is driving the response we have observed over the last 10 years? Um, and conceptually, we can think of this, um, think of, think about this like, um, you know, we know that nutrients increase or decrease from changing inputs, um, or they may be affected by changes in land use and land cover. Uh, but we know that the county has heavily invested in BMP practices to reduce those loads and has received credit for those measures. Um, we know the changes in climate may alter nutrient availability. And of course, we know that there are unidentified drivers that we haven't even thought of or simply can't measure. And we put this framework together to better understand our observed water quality responses. So we're currently working on a report uh, scheduled to be published sometime next year that attempts to link the reach scale changes um, that I've discussed today to watershed scale changes um, in the landscape. And I'm showing some, some quick snapshots of those analyses here. I'm not going to go into any depth here, but um, for example, we've summarized uh, all the management practices implemented throughout the county and their expected credit reductions. Uh, or investigating um, changes in the magnitude and timing of storm flow responses uh, that might be caused by changes in the landscape or um, BMP implementations. We've summarized changes in land use, land cover, wastewater infrastructure, population, um, you know, other similar factors that may affect change. And we're using uh, published rates of source inputs along with our computed loads, so think mass balance. Um, to better understand the, the faint transport of nutrients throughout these watersheds and, of course, much more. So um, I hope that gives everyone a good idea of the absolute and just absolute wealth of data we've collected in Fairfax County um, and the analyses that we're conducting to, you know, to better understand um, the changing conditions in these streams. I'll just say long term urban modern programs like this are, are relatively rare. Um, so, you know, we run a few others out of the, our office, um, such as in Hampton Roads and in Roanoke. Um, but in general, urban watersheds are relatively understudied. Um, you know, so I think programs uh, like these have a great value. And, and we are always looking forward, looking for opportunities, um, you know, to partner with state and local jurisdictions to, to implement additional monitoring efforts. Um, so with that, um, thanks so much for your time. And again, for putting up with this, this virtual presentation. I think that was a, a very informative uh, video. Um, I believe Aaron is with us today. So if there's any questions that you uh, have uh, on the uh, presentation, uh, please put them in the chat box in the lower right hand corner of the screen. Do we have any uh, questions or comments yet, Liz? Yeah, we have a few questions. Um, comment on excellent data and do these uh, general trends hold true in other urban areas of Virginia, or does it vary by locality? Um, first of all, thanks everyone for for uh, listening in and listening to yourself give a presentation is extremely awkward. <laughs> um, so I, I had recorded that because I was worried I might my wife might go in labor and I might not be here for this, but uh, I got to listen to myself. Um, so hard to answer that question. We run. A number of other networks, as I mentioned, um, those networks are not as mature as this one, and we like to have at least 10 years of data before we start looking into trends because that kind of cuts through. Um, we think of 10 years as kind of cutting through that uh, climate variability. We get you know wet years, dry years, average years. Um, so I don't have the data to answer that for urban settings. Um, we do see, we, we do run um, a number of stations that are part of the Chesapeake Bay um, non-tidal network, which is used for the the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay watershed model and the TMDL. Uh, these are not really analogous um, watersheds. They're, they're far, far bigger um, and generally non-urban. 
Um, so the results don't really uh, align as much, but uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that's something we want to be able to answer, you know, over the next five years or so. Great. Um, and just one more question. When looking at benthic macroinvertebrates, do the patterns suggest that there needs to be a re-evaluation in the metrics used to evaluate ecological health versus pollution tolerance? Uh, so I always get questions about the benthic stuff, which and, and I appreciate it. I'm not an ecologist, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, really focus more on hydrology. So we did partner with um, folks in the county to do those analyses. But um, I think a big takeaway from this is that when an urban jurisdiction, um, city, county is using an IBI to you know to assess, or some regulate regulatory body is using an IBI to assess. Um, the condition of those streams. Um, it's really inappropriate to, I think, to use uh, a larger scale, you know, regional IBI, um, something that's not well calibrated towards an urban setting. Um, you know, comparing urban streams to reference streams, it's, they're always going to be poor or very poor um, urban streams, no matter what you do. Um, based on our work, our research has led us to believe they'll never get back to anywhere near that reference condition. Um, so I'm not sure if that's exactly the question or answering that question exactly, but um, the Fairfax IBI, I mentioned the, the Cote metric, you know, the, the IBI is a, compare, is, a, is a combination of many of the different metrics that I'd showed in, in that bar plot, um, but it is tailored or tweaked, I guess, towards um, what is realistic within an urban stream. Gotcha, thanks. And one final question, when will your report be available? So the the report that this presentation some, or attempted to summarize is available um, and I can put a link. Uh, I'm not sure if, if I enter a chat, does everyone see that? Um, yep, you I can, can select everyone and okay. send it to everyone. I can um, give a link out to this report. Um, at the end of the talk, I alluded to another report um, that is trying to explain change, uh, explain why we're seeing what we're seeing. I think that's going to be um, a really, a really interesting report, kind of summarizing all these um, these changes. That is not published yet, but I expect it to be available online in uh, around April or May of next year. Great. Well, I uh, appreciate you uh, giving this wonderful presentation, making a great video. And I've done that myself, given a, a video and then sit in the audience. And that is kind of an odd sensation. Mm -hmm. um, we'll now take a break for a few minutes. Uh, if there, take a chance to stretch your legs, get something to uh, eat or drink and check your email. I know my email inbox is blowing up. Um, we will restart promptly at 1045. Uh, please be back by that time. Thank you. <laughs> 